Warning. The following podcast contains two morons talking about sophisticated subject matter, like ninus and hoo-hahs. Also, a few whoopsie-daisies and at least one house or ante. If you don't have a strong stomach, you know where the door is. Right. On with the shenanigans, then. The podcast which you are about to hear is an account of the tragedy which befell two washed-up losers. In particular, Court Psyops and his immature co-host, Matt. It was all the more tragic in that they were uncultured morons. But had they lived very, very full lives, they could not have expected nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see each week. For them, an idiotic podcast show became a nightmare. The events of each week were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, Cinema Psyops with Court and Matt. What is Psyops? Psyops for psychological operations is very simply the art of influencing how people feel and think and ultimately how they behave and what they do. You don't have to defeat the enemy on the battlefield. It's better if you can convince the enemy to do what you want him to do without having to fight him. And that's really the intent behind Psyops, to convince people to do what you want them to do. So how does Psyops fit into what's happening now? The two points I'd like to make with you and the audience is that first and foremost, Psyops saves lives. The second thing I'd like to say, a lot of people have misconception about Psyops. They think it's something deviant and brainwashing. You say you don't know exactly what's going on right now, but we do know that there are some Psyops going on, right? Ma'am, I don't know. Cinema Psyops. And I believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. Why I believe that is because I know how it feels. I know what it does to you. Cinema Psyops. They think it's something devious and brainwashing. to the 302nd consecutive week of Cinema PsyOps. I'm your host, Court, the guy who's going to do his best to get us all through the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 in this full franchise fest, celebrating 300 episodes and joining me live via the Skype app that will not stop updating and fucking everything up every week is my co-host, Matt. Hi, everybody. I'm the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 movie, and in no way am I a nerd compared to the other two that came before me. That's that's how I view this movie. Wow. <laughs> I actually kind of like it. I'm, I'm not going to lie. Really? I'm, yeah, I'm severely disappointed in it this time around, but I have nostalgia for this film. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I do like one character in it, or at least he makes me laugh at times. Okay, I could see that. Um, There's I'm, one character in this that makes... He's, he's a shit of a character, and he's gross and disgusting, but uh, uh, his interactions later on in the movie actually make me kind of laugh. Okay, I could kind of see that. Um, there is a character in here played by our man uh ken Forhey. yeah and yeah, he, he doesn't is, make me laugh he's just cool character yeah, yeah. well he's uh, the thing that keeps me coming back to this movie and feeling good about yeah. myself not in shape yeah. but i don't know how to perform an abortion see uh, th- he makes me feel bad about myself because not in shape but i don't know how to perform an abortion because of those reasons <laughs> <laughs> yeah but never, you're, you're getting i can never in- survive dawn of the dead <laughs> You're getting in better shape, and I mean, how I hard is it to just scrape back and forth with a coat hanger, Matt? Oh, Jesus. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I mean, by that logic, Chop Top should be okay at it, right? Yeah, I mean, Chop Top should be perfect. Oh, so our boy Ken from Rhode Island uh, made sure that he fact-checked and corrected me on last week's episode. I made Uh-oh. an egregious statement that apparently was extremely untrue. Oh, 
No. What yeah, did you do? The actor Bill Mosley, who I was in the belief was in the car at the beginning as well, is not the person who ended up playing that gunner character that uh, I hated that was, you know, firing off the gun with a lizard eyes that we were really annoyed by. Oh, really? Okay, so that isn't Bill. Okay. No, but it looks an awful lot like him and it sounds an awful lot like him. And for the entirety of my life until today, years old, I was convinced that that was Bill Mosley and he was just getting a, you know, non makeup cameo. And that's not the case. It's uh, an actor named Chris Doridis is I think is how it's pronounced D-O-U-R-I-D-I-S or Doradis or or what have you. Apparently he moved into being a DJ and things, but he's a, apparently he's a Texas actor. He's been in quite a few things, but yeah, unfortunately he was mm, the person that uh, I always mistook. So I've been misnoming him with people when I watched this movie for up until today, years old. Well, (laughs) but now you've corrected it. Just like that, things can be corrected. Well, I was corrected, and I was operating on misinformation and just old school fandom in believing that that was him for all of these years. I never bothered to look it up, which is why I was so grossly wrong. But considering that just about everything else that we say in these full franchise fests are going by my memory yeah. of, of things that I have read or things that um, I perceive to be the truth, having one or two fuck ups here and there is not so egregious. Yeah, not at all. I'm just glad I never had any of those for the Romero zombie movies, because I really pretend to be an authority on that stuff. I mean, you kind of are an authority on that stuff, so if you'd have gotten hit with that, I don't know. Probably have to close down shop at that point. <laughs> right, I'd, I'd have to uh, have my bub tattoo sandblasted off. Maybe. Yeah, we would have <laughs> laser removed your almost your entire sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> or at least the top half of it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> On my Romero sleeve. No, I can anything, still be a f- Anything Romero would have to get I, removed. I can still be a fan. I just can't, you know, try and be the moral authority or just yeah, the general just, knowledge authority for all things You can't just Romero. sit there. Yeah, you can't just sit there and go, um, listen, if we're going to talk about Romero flicks, strap in, because I'm going to tell you everything you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty egregious. I don't want to do that now, but yeah, yeah. I, can, I can totally see me at one point in time in my life doing that to someone like you. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, I know you could, because it happened. So... <laughs> Yeah, many, I don't. I don't many have drunken to arguments. To see it. I just remember it. <laughs> <laughs> many drunken arguments over Romero films. Now, yes. last week we talked about how Texas Chainsaw Massacre Two is clearly the product of a coke-addled brain. Yes, of course. And, and like most of the decisions were made by coke-addled brains. Texas yeah. Chainsaw Three, or Leatherface: colon, Texas Chainsaw Three, as the title would have you believe that it is. Yeah. This film is actually what happens when a Hollywood system tries to manufacture a slasher star and how egregiously horrible it can become and how badly they can actually fail at doing such a thing. And that's where... Agreed. That's where Leatherface colon Texas Chainsaw 3 comes into play. Now... I also would say it's like what somebody does when they get really stoned and they go, I have this great idea for a movie after watching the first two Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies. And they go, it's this original idea I have for a movie. When they're stoned. <laughs> there are some... Th- uh, there's there's some school of thoughts about how Toby Hooper initially started developing this and came up with some of the story ideas, but then had to bow out. Yeah. Um, but it's not enough for him to get any writing credits or anything like that. And the author who wrote the screenplay, David J. Shaw, has actually written some stuff that I really dig, you oh. know, including movies and stuff like that. And I'm even friends with a dude on Facebook. So nice. I, what you get well, in a uh, script. Wait, wait, here's and, what I always feel it. Number one is the art student in college who just happens to make a very good film. Number two is that same art student got completely stoned or completely high on cocaine, just really coked out and made a second film. Well, the studio gave him a bunch of money and they blew it all on cocaine and that's the film they got in the result. Yeah. Yes. And then the third one was that original art student who got all coked out for the second film, that student's slacker stoner roommate said, you know what, I've got a pretty good idea for a movie, and the studio gave him some money to make it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's actually not the case, but that's how you you view you view that's them. That's how I how view they, it. <laughs> yeah, how they feel towards you. This one is essentially um, a giraffe of a film. Okay. It's something that was designed by committee and in theory sounds like it should turn out okay. But when you look back at it and you see that it's a giraffe, you're like, what the fuck purpose does this thing serve? <laughs> 
<laughs> why, that's, that's how it is. Why is there a giraffe out here? Right. What are isn't, we doing? Isn't that the statement about a giraffe as a horse designed by committee or some shit like that? Isn't yeah, that like yeah. an old timey saying? Well, that's what yeah. this film is. It's a fucking giraffe, right? <laughs> There are parts of it that logically make sense on their own. Like, you know, oh, yeah, of course you need that really tall neck so you can reach the tops of trees because that's what you eat is stuff off the top of trees. Of course you need to yeah. be that tall. But yeah. what's what's with the hooves like a horse and all the weird spots? And yeah, what what's, are those what's knobby what's things the, on your head? <laughs> yeah, what's with the antennas? What are we doing around here? <laughs> right. What's, and if you believe in, like, God and stuff, that's just God being drunk going, I don't know. Give it a horse face and then tall legs, will you? <laughs> Hey, just do this with it, and he just stretches it out like it's, a, it's on Silly Putty or some yeah. shit. What's my quota at? Well, we need three more animals. All right. You know a horse? Yeah? Make it longer. All right. We're good. So New, Line, out. New Line Cinema had acquired the rights to make more Texas Chainsaw Massacre films. Mm-hmm. And this was at the time that the Nightmare on Elm Street series was coming to a close with Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. And they decide okay. that the next big thing that's going to be, you know, keeping the house that Freddy built afloat is going to be Leatherface. This is how they're going to do it. They're going to revive this franchise and they're going to make a bunch of movies and they're going to turn it into a franchise and they make it the new line way. And when you know that, this very much feels like the Freddy movies that came out at the time, including Nightmare on Elm Street 6, the Freddy's Dead. Yeah. It feels extremely like that. They tried it with the soundtrack to try and get some rock and sound and tunes in there. But instead of doing something that probably would bring people in, they chose 90s thrash metal, which would limit the amount of people, I would argue, that actually kind of like it. <laughs> uh, and then, I mean, just the, the production was extremely troubled. And I want to preface that before we get into this, because I'm not going to say that this is a good film. This is a poorly executed on the whole mess, but it's not the fault of one person. This There are multiple people that fucked with and screwed up this film, in including the MPAA. And the version that I ripped for you that came from my Blu-ray is as close to the unedited, uncompletely chopped up and fucked with version of, from the MPAA. It's the the version that originally got an NC-17. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I would argue that that is essentially the MPAA taxing this film like they did other slasher films at the time because so much had gotten away with and gotten through in the 80s. And if you think about it, Freddy's stuff had been getting cut like crazy by the MPAA and so much of the stuff had been tamed down and the same thing with uh, Jason and all of the Friday the 13th movies yeah. by this time in the late 80s and the early 90s the MPAA is really on a fucking mission to force a lot of editing and to and force isn't... horror movies to really not be as gory and isn't this right around the time maybe not could be just earlier than that when also like music is starting to get targeted a lot like for the parental warnings labels and shit like that or does uh, that come later that was shortly before this that was tipper right. gore going nuts yeah and that was like but John that's Denver what i'm saying though it's those like guys fighting it's, it yeah i'm saying that's like the beginning uh what led into all this kind of stuff is is that you know tipper gore leading that charge and then they went from music to movies as one does you know everything that ever starts with one medium of entertainment always moves through the rest of it yeah there was always some consternation about slasher films and horror films in general going too far and it was the early 80s and the video nasties really went nuts on it it just so happened that that moral panic that was happening over in britain took a little while before it started happening in america and unfortunately in the late 80s early 90s is when it really started hitting and the big thing that they were targeting horror wise was slasher films because they were just considered garbage garbage by okay. the general public they were just yeah they were just junk food they most people viewed slasher films the way that i view the saw series <laughs> <laughs> i've never seen one saw movie ever right and i and i don't want to just like completely shit on the saw series it's just that yeah. overall i find it wholly unsatisfying and it's just not for me it's more day trip around the crunch for people that want to think they like horror and only want to watch it when it comes out in october like that's yeah. what the saw movies are you know to me, anyway. That's just how I've always kind of seen them. And this is going to be one of those kind of films where it's designed by committee and it's an attempt to try and make a franchise and sucker in the hardcore fans. But every decision, I would argue, that they made alienates us. 
Yeah. <laughs> and let's let's stop talking around it and kind of beating around the bush. Let's let's do the Legion Patreon ad and we'll have a little music I snagged right out of the fucking film for those on the Patreon feed. And if you're on the main feed, you're going to have something completely different and not understand why the hell we're talking about Death Angel after this. <laughs> this will keep it quiet. Oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You caught me cutting a new show. I'm Bo Ransdell and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. <laughs> I said quiet! My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also, yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com, or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. We appreciate it, and thank you for listening. Now... Back to the cutting room. Angel's board, a very, very fitting song for <laughs> Texas Chainsaw 3. Right. <laughs> now, I'd like to talk just a little bit about the band Death Angel. I uh, you know that you've dabbled a little bit in metal in your day, so have you heard the name Death Angel for a band before? I have not. Wow. Okay, so they're like a Bay Area thrash metal band, and um, they're, I God, I want to, like, earliest 80s or so, I think is, what, like, like 81, 82, 83, somewhere around there, I think is when they got started. Interesting thing about the band is when they first formed, um, there was some, they were, like, fam- like two family members or, like, two cousins or something like that, and um, the rest of the band, all of them were of Filipino descent, so... Oh. They kind of got, um, you know, they, they kind of got like, I don't, I don't want to say overlooked, but like, I think like there was, you know, like most, most of the time you don't really, you know, like it was kind of like a push against them to where some people maybe didn't accept them as much. Um, yeah. or at least in the rednecky fucking racist town that I grew up in, there were people that were against Death Angel because of that. Um, oh. I, I think they fucking rip. They've written some of the coolest thrash metal songs, um, from that era. Like the second wave of thrash metal is really like the, yeah. what, what these guys have kind of done. Um, especially like the Bay Area thrash metal in the eighties. Um, that's really like they're the they're the ones. Uh, and it's weird because like all of the Bay Area sort of thrash metal bands, almost all of them, uh, in some way, shape, or form, are like featured in here in this <laughs> in this movie, like in some way, shape, or form, including the song that I'm playing, "Bored," which I feel fits rather well yeah. with the movie. Um, well, I want it. <laughs> I mean, it definitely fits way more with the movie than, say, this trailer. Some tales are told, then soon forgotten. But a legend is forever. Face, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Now, from the producers of A Nightmare on Elm Street, 
the real terror begins. November 3rd. All right. So we were kind of talking uh, behind the scenes while the trailer was playing about this. And Matt had never seen this. But the trailer for this movie is fucking awesome. And it completely betrays everything about the movie. (laughs) Really? (laughs) All right. So there's a guy standing by a lake in a peaceful, like, sort of surrounding. Like, just looking at the lake. And everything's peaceful and loving and happy. And that's where that music that was kind of playing under us talking before I played the trailer comes in, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, we see from the lake, a lady's arm extends out that Excalibur version of the chainsaw that's in this movie, like the all chromed up one. They called it the Excalibur. Oh, yeah. And then tosses it to the guy standing there staring at the lake, who catches it, fires it up, turns out it's Leatherface. Now, Uh the thing that really betrays me personally about this film, the man dressed as Leatherface who catches that chainsaw and fires it up is Kane Hodder. Oh, really? Yes, in the trailer. Now, Kane Hodder is the stunt coordinator on this film, and he ends up actually doing the stunts for Leatherface. But the thing that this trailer really whets my appetite for was, what if a young Kane Hodder got to play the actual Leatherface in this film? What if they let Kane do it? How much more cruel and vicious would that Leatherface have been? And that whets my appetite. And then when I watch the movie, I'm always let down. Oh, yeah, that would have been cool. But there's some sequences where Kane is doing the stunt work, and when Leatherface is fighting, that vicious brutality, you can tell that's Kane, yeah. which makes those sequences really fun to fucking talk about, and I can't wait to speculate whether or not that's Kane kicking ass and taking names. Yeah. <laughs> so let's fucking do it. All right. Well, Leatherface takes his seeds on my Scott 3. Uh, well, we start out with narration, so we start out with our first clip. I feel like this is going to be a motif for this franchise. As long as there's narration at the beginning, there's always going to be a clip. On August 18th, 1973, Sally Hardesty, her invalid brother Franklin, and their friends fell afoul of a bizarre cannibalistic clan of serial predators. Hardesty was the sole survivor of that night of terror. She died in a private health care facility in 1977. A single member of the murderous family lived to see trial. The prosecution recorded his name as W.E. Sawyer. He died in the gas chamber in 1981. The jurors concluded that Leatherface, presumed to be an unapprehended killer, was in fact an alternate personality of Sawyer's, activated whenever he donned a crude mask made of human flesh. If there was no Leatherface in reality, then Sally Hardesty may at last rest in peace. If there actually was a Leatherface, he remains at large, and the so-called Texas Chainsaw Massacre was only the beginning. beginning. So we're now just saying number two never happened. Kind of, yeah. Because, I mean, the whole family died there. Leatherface died in that one. So we're just saying never happened. Well, right. And they're suspecting, too, that Leatherface was just a personality and someone who would don the mask. And they're totally betraying the Leatherface from the first movie. Yeah. So I think what they're trying to get at is this is just like a family trait that some of them have that or some shit. Who knows? Yeah. Well, or, yeah, maybe there's a lot of deformed people in this family. But however it is, uh, I'm just going to go off of they're going to ignore number two and just number one happened and now here's this. Oh, this is an attempt at a franchise reboot for sure. Yeah. We see a lady getting whacked in the head with a hammer. Uh, then we see bits and pieces of uh, carving, pe- some somebody carving up flesh in a face uh, as the title credits roll. And we see it's Leatherface. He's working on carving on this thing. We see a woman's watching him. She makes a noise, but she runs off before he can see her. Uh, so then we cut to a couple named Michelle and Ryan, and they're driving from California to Florida. She's returning her, uh, a, the car they're driving into her father. But it sounds like the relationship's going to take a break once they get to California, or once they get to Florida. Well, they start listening to the radio, and they keep hearing a report about a pit of bodies found, like 50 of them. Um, Then we cut to uh, that night, and we see these guys going through this pit of bodies, uh, these medical examiners. And they're having to wear the the protective suits because the bodies are now poisonous. Um, uh, We see, like, a head, all this kind of shit. It's, It's pretty grody. It's some grody shit. 
So not bad. Uh, the, uh, the effects in this are actually quite excellent, and especially yeah. the adiposer, I think is what it's called. It's uh, when the body breaks down into the creamy fats that become this highly toxic substance. And I yeah. love the way they're really pushing it, like, this will give you gangrene, this will be all bad stuff. You yeah. know, there's there's no way that, you know, you survive it. It gets on your skin, you get gangrene, you get it in a cut, you're pretty much dead. Like, they're really selling this stuff, and then that goes nowhere for the rest of the fucking movie. Yeah, no. Where I'm like, I was waiting to see what would happen with this, but apparently nothing. Nothing at so, all. Right next to this, there's a checkpoint where, of course, cops are checking all cars, seeing if they can find who's responsible for all these bodies. Um, they uh, make it through, the couple make it through the checkpoint with a police officer tersely telling them, don't stop for anyone or anything and just get out of the state as fast as you can. Um the next day, they're driving, and they run over an armadillo, and they get fucking weirded out, and they stop the car. No one ever does that. You run over an armadillo, you just keep going. Uh, but they get out, and uh, then they have to kill it with the rocks. It's still alive. I believe that she would do it. Oh, yeah. She, she's, she, she strikes me as somebody who's ripe to get, you know, fucking kidnapped by a cannibal family. Well, the reason that I believe specifically that she would do it is because she is, in fact, the kind of person that would stop because she's very trying to be kind to her gentleman and all of that kind of stuff, even though she's pretty much dumping his ass is what yeah. she's telling him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, she's like, we're going to oh, take yeah. a break and we're going to we're going to move. But that doesn't mean that we can't enjoy each other's company now and actually communicate and all of that. And he's just being like a complete douchebag. And I want to I want to back up just a little bit. Did you okay. recognize the dude that's playing her boyfriend? Did he look familiar? I think to you I, anyway? I, he looked familiar to me, but I just don't know from what. Night of the Living Dead 90, the remake that was directed by Savini and sanctioned by the Image 10 group. And he was, he the, was the, 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 the character that like comes up from the basement with Judy Rose. <laughs> yep, all right, I wondered. Oh yeah. my God, I recognize that fucking voice. Yeah, I can't think of uh, the character's name off the top of my head right now because uh, yeah. all I know is that he gets barbecued in that. But that's that's him, that's where he was, uh, where you would probably recognize him from, first of all. That apostle or whatever, they're hearing this all on the radio when they, right and he's before a, they run he's over the He's pre-med, so he, he knows all about this shit. Yeah, and then he's the one that tells us all. He's the expository dialogue, and they really yeah. are setting this up like it's going to be something, but it goes nowhere. And goes that's on. when they hit the armadillo, and then she can't put the armadillo out of its misery. But she, she, so he has to do it with a rock, right? And I think this whole thing is just now a that shorthand is to show God. foreboding something. Well, yeah, if I you think, think about it. Yeah, I think what they're trying to do is show that um, she doesn't have the killer instinct, even when she would be putting an animal out of its misery. She can't bring herself to end a life. And that's well, why and she like, has to have her, her man and, do it. And it's the whole thing with the rock thing. It, 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 that, all, that actually comes back. Right. So... Did you notice that the armadillo had an earring? Yes, I did. And, and that will come back as well. Yeah. There's a couple of things like creatures and animals, various places that have earrings in yeah. this. And that's weird. And I, that doesn't really mean anything other than it's just there. And I think it's an Easter egg. The uh, beginning intro that you were talking about with uh, Leatherface making a new mask, carving up the face and all that gross stuff. Did that yeah. remind you of anything in particular? A specific type of opening sequence for a horror movie? Did that remind you of something? Me, no. It's Nightmare on Elm Street. That's how Nightmare on Elm Street starts, is Freddy building his glove. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah, a motif I, I that, that it's a motif that New Line goes back to on Nightmare on Elm Street several times. And I'm yeah. thinking that they're assuming that that would work here. We can see Leatherface building a new mask. Yeah, I got it, you. It just feels kind of like, who the fuck forced that idea? You yeah. Know? Like to like, I'm not. I'm not opposed to seeing Leatherface plus, make a mask. If he's building a new mask, he never wears it. Right. Nor does it ever come into play again. Yeah, and I'm I'm not opposed to seeing Leatherface build a new mask, but like, wouldn't that sequence have worked better if he did that out of her boyfriend's face or something yeah. along those lines? Like, or someone else that it became part of the story and meant something more than just trying to emulate Nightmare on Elm Street's intro because you're yeah. trying so hard to make Leatherface your next Freddy. You know, like that's why I had to bring it up and bitch about it now and not wait till the 20 minutes because I didn't want to forget. All right, I'm good. I got you. All right, so then we come to a gas station and we see. Aragon, he gets out of a car. So I'm like, is this Lord of the Rings? What are we doing? Uh, then the couple show up, and uh, he, the Ryan goes to use gas while Michelle's waiting. The attendant, who is um, 
Well, he's a fucking weirdo. And he takes a picture of Michelle, offers to sell it to her for $2. When she says no thank you and just needs to fill up because they're in a hurry, he gets really um, uh, rapey. <laughs> Uh, first of all, he uses this scare device that's clearly a baby's fucking rotten skull attached to the yeah. end of like this, um, uh, sort of like accordion thing that shoots out at her to scare her. Then he snaps uh-huh. a photo of her and he demands five bucks. Then he goes down to three sixty nine, and then he drops down to two something after that. Yeah. And when she won't buy it, that's when he gets really fucking rapey. So once again, uh, horse designed by committee giraffe. In this case, they're trying to get the pieces that worked in the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre with trying to sell the photo and the guy being weird and creepy but the thing that they fucked up because apparently this is something new line likes they make him rapey as opposed to yeah. just violent and a little bit psychotic well uh aragron he kind of scares him off tells him to get away and uh then he's talking to michelle and um the boyfriend comes out ryan comes out and he's hoping to get a ride but they're Again, on a tight schedule, so they can't. Well, Shell goes to use the restroom, and we see the fucking rapey dude. He's fucking spying on her. While this is happening, Aragon is trying to explain to Ryan that that map was made in, like, in the 70s. And the quickest way isn't the highway to get out of Texas. It's this other road. 1973, when the original one was made. Yep. So, planting some seeds there, maybe. Well, anyway, then we see Aragon. He catches the weird guy, and they have a fight, and the couple gets scared away because the guy has a shotgun. So, they drive away, and he shoots out the back window, and then what appears like he starts shooting at Aragon, killing him. Uh, or his name is Tex, as the couple speeds away. And that ends our first 20 minutes. Now, the first time that I watched this, I immediately recognized who you're referring to as Aragon, but Vigo Mortensen as the devil from The Prophecy. The Prophecy. Do you remember oh, the Prophecy? The devil and the Prophecy? Yeah, you remember the prophecy, yeah. don't you? Yeah, I didn't know he was the devil in the prophecy. Yeah, <gasps> he delivers one of my favorite lines uh, in that movie. Oh, Rob, right. what's that? Well, he's talking to Virginia Madison's character, and he asks if they can talk, and she goes to walk away or something like that, or just pretty much refuse him. And then he responds with, I can lay you out and fill your mouth with the feces of your mother, or we could talk. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> he says it like really sing songy and kind of just the yeah. way Vigo Mortensen delivers lines and you know I just I, he's he's like one of the best fucking cinematic devils if not the best cinematic devil and it's so unfortunate that it's just this short little moment in the film but he owns that movie when he's in it and it's just like he does in this one you can see he's got tons of charisma and just like a go-getter fucking attitude through the whole entirety of this film and this is a motif that we're gonna see we're gonna see actors go on to great heights and just become these amazing actors who got their start in this franchise. Yeah, it's really true. Um, so, uh, yeah. Anything else to add in this 20? Uh, the intro is very clearly trying to condense down everything that happens in the first like hour yeah. of the first movie. Um, and I don't know if you're astute enough to really pay attention, even if, say, perchance, this is the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie you've ever seen. Just if you're a horror fan in general, you can already read between the lines of everything that happened in that gas station. So much yeah. so that I don't think that I'm ruining it for anyone when I say that this entire thing was just one giant elaborate setup and the elaborate setups to get people to where they need them to be for butchery for this chainsaw family just gets more ridiculous as the series goes yeah, on pretty much yeah <laughs> and this, wrong. this is almost the most egregious one for this like elaborate stage play that they set up here at the gas station <laughs> i mean it's so obviously an elaborate stage play too like i mean anyone would recognize this the first time they watch this movie if they've ever seen any horror movie ever before it's such an obvious stage play that they're setting up to get this couple to go in the direction they want them to go yeah you are not wrong <laughs> <laughs> all right so we start the next 20 minutes the couple is freaking out while driving um they uh decide that they have to uh the ryan decides they should take uh uh texas route that he had kind of said we you should take this route so they they take that route 
Um, then we see cuts to a big truck leaves this gas station. All the while, the creepy dude's cheering him on. So it's not the creepy dude who's doing this. Well, the truck pulls up on him and throws a dead coyote at them. Then they get a flat tire and have to pull over to change it. Did you notice the dead coyote also had an earring? Oh, that part I didn't notice. Right. I didn't see that part. I was yesterday years old the first time I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> and I watched it on the projector and I felt dirty the entire time. But that's the only reason that I saw it. The thing had the earring. I think it was when they were dealing with the carcass later, yeah. you know, that I noticed it. But I did notice it. That had an earring as well. Hmm. Nice. <laughs> so uh, as they're changing the tire, they keep hearing like this creak. And we see this leg walking that has a leg brace, a metal leg brace on it. And she keeps, and finally he gets the the tire changed, uh, but the lug nuts are not on all the way. But he's like, it's fine for right now because they keep hearing this noise. As the light comes up, there's Leatherface. Leatherface attacks. And then all of a sudden, uh, amazingly, she can't start the car as he keeps chopping it up. Then all of a sudden, she starts the car but can't get into gear. Finally, they get into gear and they're able to take off and get away from him. Well, not driving, before he, he pulls the hood or the, 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 the trunk, trunk completely off, off after, after yep. chainsawing the fuck out of it. This Leatherface rips the trunk off and yeah. i'm gonna speculate the violent ripping of the trunk and the chainsawing that felt like cane hotter to me because there's sequences where the actor's playing leatherface and the way that he moves and carries his body is nowhere near as menacing and i think having Kane do the action and the fighting really helped sell him as menacing and scary that's true i'm sure yeah I can see that. So, anyway, they're driving, and Ryan keeps badgering her that they got to pull over so he can put tighten the lug nuts now. And she's freaking out, but he find, she's fine. But then as they look up, there's a bloody text around the street. Well, right before this, we see our friend Ken Forey. He's driving his Jeep, just listening to the radio, minding his own fucking business. And as she swerves, he has to swerve. Her Ryan and Michelle's car goes off an embankment down a hill where uh Ken's it's just kind of flips over. Uh he flips up he drives up onto a hill and it flips over uh onto its uh roof. Well it's also so, a Jeep, so it's designed to be able yeah. to survive such a thing and be righted back over and keep working. Yes. Well he heads down to help the two out of their car, and that's our next clip. Gotta keep moving, we can't stick around here. Oh. You can't even stand around right now. So you just take care. There's some people after us. A guy with a chainsaw. You saw what? A chainsaw. Uh-huh. Listen, I don't want you to move right now. Sounds like you're just a few quarts shy of a full tank. You know what I mean? Hold still. Hold still. There's a bunch of guys and they have guns too. Yeah, I know. And chainsaws. Militant lumberjacks. I see him all the time. Yeah, I want you to take one of these. I can't believe it. I've been going up in the hills every weekend for two years. I never even seen another car on that road. I got a survival camp with a few buddies of mine. I'm trying to keep in training for the big blow up, you know what I mean? Do you hear what I'm saying, man? Huh? We're being hunted! Hunted? Yeah. Right, I hear you, man. Okay. Okay, take it easy. Take it easy. You're all right. Most of this stuff looks sufficient. Just sit up. There we go. Okay. Here, I want you to take one of these. Okay. The water. Dex, he's still up there. Who? How are you? My name's Benny. The sorry ass uh, bastard you almost hit. We gotta move, they might find us. You people are serious. Mister, do you see this? How many? We don't know. Two, maybe more. One's on foot and he's got that. An awfully big saw. Tex, did you see him out there? No, I couldn't see nothing except your headlights. He could still be up there. We gotta go check on it. Oh. Wait a minute. What did you give us? Painkillers. Might make you a little sleepy. What? Are you nuts? We have got to move. No, just hold it, hold it. I can handle this. I'm prepared for this kind of thing. Now you guys just relax and I'll go find your friend. No, man, they're up there. Look, pal, it doesn't make it any different from anywhere else. Now I'll go get some goodies out of the Jeep. And find your buddy. 
stay. Okay. <laughs> Did you clip that just because pretty much Ken Forhe owned that whole entire scene? Yeah. All right. Listen. I, no complaints here I, then. I did a few more clips than previous movies. Not that it was more clippable. Either A, uh, some interaction in this movie. One of these clips is going to make no sense to anybody why I would clip it, except for it made me laugh my balls off when I watched it. That's it. And then this <laughs> time, it's because Ken Forhe just fucking owns this scene. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to clip that. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. All right. Well, yeah. Um, Ken Forhe is the main redeeming quality of this film for me. And then also seeing Viggo Mortensen, a.k.a. Aragon. So Ken, he goes up, uh, or Benny, I guess, as in the film. He goes up and... Without any jets. Goes, yeah, no jets, just Benny. Uh, he goes up and he finds this weird dude setting down flares. One-handed dude, he's got a hook for another hand and talks about how pretty the flares are. Well, he says, hey, well, can you help me flip my Jeep over? He says, yeah, hop in. He goes, great. And he looks in the back of the truck and we see, we see it's the same truck that threw the coyote. We see that. And as uh, Benny gets back, he sees chainsaws in the back of the truck. So he says, hold on, I got to grab something. The guy also so, is a little hostile about the flares because oh, he does say, yeah. will you help me flip over my Jeep? And then he's like trying to pretend like he's not understanding him. And I think he's fucking with him because he's a racist, I think is oh, what they're hinting yeah. at. And then he's like, what do you think all the fucking flares are for, asshole, or some shit like that? <laughs> yeah. And it's not until Benny sees the chainsaw and flip, like, you know, decides just he's got to go get something off the Jeep, a.k.a. his weapons, that the guy pretty much just drops any mask of civility that he would have had anyway and if you're paying attention he has the same earring as the armadillo and the dead coyote that got thrown at the car this is correct so <laughs> whatever's going on why the fuck that is why they put earrings on animals what that has to do with anything who knows but that's just what they did that was a choice they made in this film right and no one it's never really explained yeah um, it's not said that this guy did that or anything it's just no it's just it's that just, he's got the same earring as the animals yeah yeah so anyway with all this malarkey still happening uh thank you mr biden oh sorry. yeah yeah <laughs> malarkey um <laughs> it's a fun word yeah so he goes uh benny goes he gets his fucking uh uh assault rifle out of his car and he starts he, his, his bullets are in a coffee can but he's loading up a magazine and the guy gets tired of waiting so he just rams his truck right into the jeep sending benny down a hill uh hold this gun i think the bullets uh, are in a coffee can because the ammo being in a coffee can would help seal it up and keep it dry uh, that could be yeah maybe he doesn't have a waterproof ammo box or whatever and then maybe also it's in an ammo can because that fits in the wheel well of his jeep better or something along those lines because he kind of gets the stuff from a bunch of different areas so it's like he's even hiding the rifle somewhere else in the jeep too like when he's grabbing yeah. the stuff he's in a hurry but he's clearly getting it from different areas and i think he's just trying to conceal it all um although why he wouldn't have at least one pre-loaded clip for the gun somewhere ready to go other than yeah, maybe it's... laws and regulations or something like that but well, i mean it's also could be because he's a person of color in texas <laughs> so if a cop pulls him over ever uh. yeah but really a person of color in any state there is any yeah. excuse that usually a cop that will pull them over will use to kill them regardless so yes he may be a little extra cautious for that i think yeah. in all reality it's all in these different areas because they needed to build tension and make us that's, worry that he couldn't get it loaded in time yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah, is, it's uh, it's fucking it, lame, right? It just looked like he had to load it. It looks like he had to put it together, too. Yeah, yeah. He had, to, like I like I said, he had the gun yeah. in parts, like, hidden throughout the Jeep, and I was thinking he was doing it to conceal it, and that's yeah. why he had to throw the gun all together and everything like that in a hurry. But, I mean, really, the whole reason they did this is to try and build tension and make you wonder if he could get it built in time before the guy comes to get him, or yeah. Leatherface pops out, and it just it's just kind of forced and hackneyed and kind of dull. <laughs> Well, as he gets up, Leatherface attacks him, and they kind of fight. He fights back and forth with Leatherface, kind of gets the better of him on an occasion. But Leatherface takes out a small circular saw and cuts his leg. And then, just as it looked like Leatherface is about to cut him down with the chainsaw, the same girl from before who was watching him, she yells out at him that, "Hey, you know, you want me? You, you don't want him? You want me, asshole!" And she runs. So Leatherface leaves. Well, Did you recognize that actress from anything who was the... I recognize the her, but I don't wondering. know what from. 
she, she was familiar. the the thing that I think you would recognize her the most from anyway. You specifically. This is also for our listeners because this is what I recognized right. her from and didn't even realize it. She was the best friend of the main character in Just One of the Guys. Oh, okay. The, the, yeah. The female reporter or student reporter who yeah, pretended, pretended to be, to be a, dude. a guy to make a story and goes to a different school. She was the friend and like the one that her, her brother was always like hitting on that friend and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but most of us would remember Cheryl and Fenn from just one of the guys and really just only think about Cheryl and Fenn from that point forward when they remembered she was in it. Yeah. Uh, well, there you go. Uh, anyway. Ken finally catches up to this girl, and that's actually our next clip. What the hell's going on? What's going on? Girl, I need some questions answered, and I need them answered right now. Do you understand me? Hey. I'm sorry. I didn't know you were hurt that bad. The part is still cooking. They're still out there. You some kind of soldier or what? Just on the weekends. <laughs> wrong weapon, wrong war. They got us a week ago. I'm the only one left. Me and my sister. Sisters. We go together. Week. Maybe five days ago. A week? What the hell are you still doing here? Keep your voice down! They watch the road. They hunt people. They really hunt them. They trap them and they kill them. I haven't been able to get out of the woods. We just stopped to help this guy. We thought he'd been run over. <laughs> Day before yesterday, I had eaten a fucking rat raw. And some berries that tasted, tasted like they've been thrown up once already. It's just, I mean, it... Thanks for what you did. And that actually goes into, that ends at 20 minutes. So we oh, we can't. we'll start a new 20 minutes if you have anything to say. Yeah, we got to back way the hell up to the live reports of the adipose uh, tissue. I forgot to mention something. All right. Uh, there is a female reporter who's interviewing a gentleman. Did you recognize the female reporter? I did not. That was the he... that was the same actress who played Stretch, Caroline Williams. Oh, holy shit. Really? Yes. That now, was her? Yes. Now, the director claims that that was supposed to be Stretch was the idea. Like, in the commentary uh, thing, they make a statement that the idea would have been that that was Stretch who was chasing them as a reporter, and it could have possibly, like, after her trauma, she became a reporter, which she'd always wanted to be, you know, and do serious work and has been tracking down Leatherface and the family ever since or has been working uh, on that. That was the idea nice. and if they would have carried this on to the franchise that they wanted to do with that, I think they probably maybe would have continued it. At, at part two I hinted at that, that we sort of see a resurgence of Stretch come back or that that was the idea maybe but like then it never really goes anywhere and that's the most of what we get for Caroline Williams and also the character of Stretch ever again in the films was well, that, that possible idea that she's alive and well and is a reporter now channeling her trauma into attacking the family and tracking them down well there you go that's interesting though nice yeah it's it's a distinct possibility but um i would say that by the end of that the chainsaw dance that stretch does i don't think she's going to be coming back to the point where she'll be able to be a reporter but yeah. maybe they'll find a way to make that happen but in this uh horse designed by committee giraffe of a film nothing really ever gets delivered on anything that's ever really paid off it's like yeah. this string of ideas and all these weird dots that make no sense and never get connected uh, if we want to move a little bit forward, by the time Ken Forhey finally shows up, the film picks up. It, yes, it, it kind it really of does. it gives you somebody you can anchor on to because both of the main characters in this, the couple, are milquetoast as fuck. They yeah, are. They really are. Oh, and like I just, uh, you know, like they're trying to make the passenger annoying character out of the would be you know ex boyfriend guy who's also a medical student, but like uh. he's not abrasive like Franklin to where like you know you really feel anything you just want him to shut the fuck up and put his headphones back on and you just both of them yeah basically I yeah. mean it's not like she's like some great heroine who I want to hear from a lot 
No, the, the entire car ride with them is just causing uh, me physical pain. I like, I'm just, the, I like the quote unquote crazy lady who we just heard from. I liked her better. Yeah. And I feel like they're trying to hint that at least in this film, that there are multiple versions of this family and they're all the same family and they have like a homestead area that they all come back to, but they have various working remote locations. The big thing for this particular branch of the family is they want to hunker down and they want to survive. And the way that they do that is by hunting on the highway because there's no deer or any other kind of wildlife that they could live off of. And clearly because they're in certain parts that are, you know, more bramble and and dusty and and desert areas of of Texas, apparently, you know, the more desert like areas, they they can't really grow any crops either. But they're not leaving the homestead or some shit like that. Like like you get that feeling that that's what it is. Whereas in one and two, they were a family of somewhat nomads by two because they had to go somewhere else to hide. But then again, it was 14 years later, so maybe that's just where they went as that underground layer. Yeah, and also for being nomads, they were very famous in that part of Texas. Well, at least Drayton Sawyer was, yeah. 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 Uh, So, like, you know, like, they're they're trying to hint at that this family picks up and moves, but, like, there's no house where their body dumps are. They have to drag their body dumps further away. And they they really are hinting at that they found another body dump for this family, but the family has since moved on to another location, you know? But they don't. Yeah. They don't really, there's like no house around there or any anything that would have been a house that makes any sense as to why there's a body dump there. You think they would have at least talked about a house that burned down that was like supposedly abandoned or something along those lines, you know, in that at that other location to try and set that up. But like, I feel like they're going with that the family has gone somewhat nomad and just moves into all of these somewhat abandoned houses and farms, you know, and takes them over and like fixes them up for them to live in, but yeah. then goes and leaves them abandoned again. But again, it's all ideas that they set up and hint at, but they don't really develop or give you any time to really think about it. They're just like, never mind that. Let's move on to the next thing. You know, it's just the whole entire film is just this giant, frustrating, like, again, giraffe. And you're like, why the fuck is the dot there? And what's with that bushy thing on the end of that long ass tail? That doesn't make any sense. Are you trying to get rid of flies with that? What What is that there for? What, what are we doing around here? <laughs> right. And so like the nomadic version of the family. The quality assurance. All right. The nomadic version of the family is kind of like the tale where it doesn't quite make sense until you kind of think about it and fill in the blanks on your own that they're moving around, you know, and that's why yeah. there's that body dump because it was really far away, even though they drove past it from where they ended up with the house when the family came. Yeah, and got it, was, again. it was nighttime when they passed it. And then when they hit the armadillo later, it was daytime. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. So like the family has moved on further down the line on these highways and shit. Right. But is that yeah. supposed to be the first house? Is that the body? pit from the original house that they could never find according to the second movie you know maybe yeah yeah <laughs> like again that or, or that or no one thought about it and just put in a body pit <laughs> again yeah it's another one of those things where it's like there's all these ideas that are hinted at and there's really cool um scratching the surface things that they could have done to make this super creepy and made it feel like it's been going on for generations of the family you know yeah. and like the leather face that we know and love from the first movie and that family isn't the same leather face from the second movie or the third movie like it's like you know like it's like this family curse or some shit you know like they were trying yeah. to set something like that up but they never deliver any of it and again it's this fucking horse designed by committee of a movie Ugh. <laughs> this Jesus fucking Christ. giraffe <laughs> let's, yeah let's just move on because I'm, I'm so right. fucking done already <laughs> you went on way longer than i thought you should have for that one me uh, too because <laughs> i'm so frustrated and i have to vent to somebody about this <laughs> All right, well, Michelle and Ryan, they wake up from their drug-induced sleeping. They go looking for Benny, and they start calling out for him. When we see Benny's having a smoke with Crazy Lady, and he can hear him, so he tells her to stay there, and he goes to find him. Um, As Benny walks uh, around in the woods there, he finds something, he trips it, and it's a trap that closes. So he's like, all right, well, there's traps around here. Was that the one that was like a Vietnam version of the yeah. tiger, like with the spikes yeah. on it and stuff? Yep, yep. And it would have, I mean, it would have killed somebody instantly. So, yeah, it seems like kind of not the level of a trap that you would want to do for meat you were going to eat. Or at least, at least not the Sawyers. So, well, uh, I, it's not that I would have a problem with the Sawyers because some of them probably did serve in Nam because we know for sure. Well, no, but not, not the kind 
kind of trap the Sawyers would want to use for their purposes. Right, because where it was perforating is about the colon and nether guts region, and anyone who has dealt with meat and has ever tried to remove the bowels of an animal like that will tell you, you do not want to perforate the bowels in any no. way, shape, or form. You destroy the meat, and you make it un- unedible for you. You, yeah. you make it toxic. You want to get rid of that stuff. I mean, yeah, you could kind of wash it out or whatever, but the level of where that was going to stab someone is in an area that would perforate their bowel and destroy all of the meat. <laughs> and also, yeah. it's in the middle of nowhere, oh, far away from the house. Like, is this a home defense mechanism? Why is it so far away? Well, if they are hunting, why is it at that level? Like, why isn't it just, you know, get it in, not necessarily the leg, but like, you know, aim for the heart or someplace where there's yeah. less meat and you get an instant kill. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it just, again, stuff that they hint at, but is, upon introspection, really frustratingly dumb and doesn't make any sense for this family. You went way more under that than I think you needed to. I think I can see how bothered you are by this movie. This is all the shit that I was reality, thinking about. In reality, this movie should be good. <laughs> yeah, and it didn't. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff about it where it's just, it's super frustrating, even so where the stuff that they have set up that the family would do doesn't make any sense. The leg traps that they have throughout the forest makes more sense for the family's hunting. If they're hunting people that may or may not have gotten away from them, you yeah. know, but this like crotch level trap is just an excuse to have that kind of trap. But this family would not be hunting with that kind of trap. No. <laughs> so anyway, as then we cut to, cause if I don't move us on, you'll stay on this, about this trap for the next hour and a half. Yeah. I'm fucking pissed. <laughs> So anyway, then, uh, unfortunately, uh, as Crazy is walking around, uh, she gets jumped by Leatherface, who chainsaws her up and kills her. Then Leatherface decides to start chasing uh, Michelle and Ryan. Um, as they run away from him, Ryan gets caught up in a bear trap, tells Michelle to leave him. She does. Uh, and it looks like uh, Leatherface is getting ready to like start slicing into him, but it cuts away real quick. Well, she runs and she finds a house. Oh, she runs inside. I, I got oh. you the edited version then because you actually see Leatherface chainsaw him a little bit. Oh, really? You see yeah, more no, her reaction to it. But yeah, he chainsaws him a little bit. And like it's you... And here's another thing too. If you are uh, if you're trying to injure someone in such a way with a chainsaw that they will bleed out, why is he cutting yeah. in the guts if he wants to preserve that meat for later? Yeah, I have no idea. I, I see, like it got real close and she screamed and ran away, but I never saw the chainsaw like enter him. Oh well, yeah, you never really. I, I, you kind of don't so see it in the just, unread I version. Probably said the same thing. So I just said I don't. It looks like he does because you think it's a lot worse because then he pops up later. So yeah, but they kind of chainsawed him on the side. But there's plenty of people that are getting brutalized by chainsaws in one scene and seem perfectly yeah. fine and unharmed in others in this. But you do see a little bit more blood whenever he gets chainsawed in the the fully unrated version. So I must have gotten the DVD for you, and I must have gotten you the um the R rated version that's a little more cut. So I'll tell you when there's more gore if you oversteps or if you kind of step over something, but. There, right. There's slightly more blood in that. You do see a little bit of blood with the chainsawing. Hmm. All right. <laughs> uh, let's see here. She just ran off and, you know, he's dead yeah, now. Yeah, so she finds a house. She goes inside and there's this little girl that seems crying up the top of the stairs. Well, she goes upstairs and the little girl, she's sitting in her room and she's crying and just at a table in the room's dark. And as she bends down to see the little girl, the little girl starts laughing and stabs her to the leg with a makeshift shiv from bone. Um, just then as she backs up, Tex grabs her and turns on the, uh, lights and you see this whole room is just nothing but bones. Um, so, you know, there's some death that been happening here. Well, they nail her to a chair and literally through her hands. And then that leads to our next clip. More little nails if you don't stay put. Why are you doing this? Because if you don't poke them, then they don't leak. <laughs> If you don't leave, we can't feed Grandpa. Silly. Ruckus, ruckus, my nap is just a goner. Certainly hope you children are pleased with yourselves. Where's Junior? Mopping up, Mama. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what you always say. Mopping up. Yeah, which means you ain't caught them all yet, just like last time. Please! What have we done? Can't you stop this? You best shut them 
tongue up or I'll do your tongue first. That's right. Best not to get Mama's dander up. We're home with bacon, Mom. <laughs> Come on, Jess, give me a hand here. Trap all. Fancy sneakers. <laughs> all right now. Pretty good size, ain't it? Yeah, he's a keeper. <laughs> well, Junior's been getting out of hand lately. But I got a present for him. I got a flying present. Gonna keep him in line. Yes, sir. Like that last present you got in that um, electronic thing, Jay? Of course you did. That's progress, boy. <laughs> Technology is our friend. You might even learn something. Ain't that right, Mama? We <laughs> think our little lady. <laughs> Uncertain. Looks to me like she might go all screamy on us, Eddie. I wish you'd call me and text. I told you. I'm sorry, boy. God damn it, I'm sorry. How'd you like to do us honor of plugging that whore up? Yes, sir. Hey, Ted. This is still kicking. Yippee, I, hey. <laughs> hey, if you need anything. Just twitch. <laughs> so, a few things to unpack in this scene here that was just recorded. So, we have Grandpa. Another grandpa sighting. Uh, he is now very dead. I don't think he's alive at all. Yeah, it's if he is, the other he's, times alive. he's alive. Yeah, it, it, I think he's very dead. It, well, grandma's definitely dead because grandma's not in this one like she was in the second one. But remember, yeah. grandma had her arms ripped off and just spat her dust out of the yeah. arms, but then still moved whenever you know Chop Top went to check on her. Her head still moved yeah. on its own. He didn't move it. Um, so I don't know. Maybe grandpa's not dead. But then again, they've been filling him up with blood and when he gets shot later in the chest in the stomach area a bunch of blood comes pouring out yeah but he doesn't move when that happens to him so yeah yeah i'm gonna say that when he's finally shot he's definitely this grandpa is definitely already dead yeah, yeah. <laughs> which, which you know they always have hinted that there's something with this family that's a little more evil and supernatural because they live unnaturally long lives on their blood diets and their human food diets you know yeah but they completely drop that in this one almost. Like, just try to make them, like, rapey backwoods cannibal freaks. I mean, they just basically are smashing Texas Chainsaw Massacre together with Deliverance in this. Kind of seems that way, yeah. Yeah, and they really amp up the sadism of the family where they actually would rather make people suffer than not, you know? Like, it's another side of it that's, like, completely different where it's not meat. They recognize that they're tormenting humans and enjoy it. You know, yeah. they don't look at them as beeves or cattle. They are looking at them as humans that they can make suffer. And they're a much more sadistic version of the family in this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I agree. So it's just kind of um yeah it's a, it's a it's a weird uh, it's a weird dynamic there for this family. Um, so there's part one, part two. The mother's little voice box is cool because you know they, it looks like they just did it up themselves. So well, the one guy is like a tinkerer and he knows electronics and technology is our friend. You know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, like even his uh, hook seems like it's a little bit more automated because he's able to hold things with it that like a normal hook like that wouldn't hold so well. So it looks like he's maybe modified it a little bit and you know the dude with the earring and everything and they say that he made uh junior some kind of electronic gizmo that he can learn with and everything too so yeah we'll we'll see that later yeah we'll actually um, see it but they talked about it in your clip yeah yeah so i yeah there's a there's a whole lot of good good stuff in here um yeah these moments are okay these moments are pretty solid this is a 
This is pretty solid. Oh, they drag in Ryan and they hook him through his ankles. And then that's when he said, you know, if you need anything, just twitch. He's talking to Ryan because they see he's actually still alive. He's not dead yet. But he's, he's pretty close. Yeah. He's pretty because he's yeah hung up upside down. Did you see so. the hooks go through the back of the ankles? Yes. Oh, then you did get the unrated version. Wait, no, they did it. And then you see it after it's done. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, the unrated version actually has, you can see some of the hooks going through the ankles. It's oh, just, yeah, no. It's just they slightly showed, more extended uh, and gory stuff in the unrated I see. version. Yeah, they showed Michelle screaming while they were doing that to him. Yeah, okay, so you saw you saw yeah. the R-rated version. I saw the R-rated version. Oh, so yeah, yours is going to be even more disappointing because you got all the good stuff cut out. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> The only thing I got that could actually make me gross out even a little bit was like the, all the squishy noises they kept making when they did anything with blood or anything like that. That was it. Yeah, that was pretty heavy on the soundtrack. But yeah, there's some more visually gross out stuff in the uh, NC-17 slash unrated version of this. Ah, um, but anyway, that's all from this clip uh, visually that I wanted to talk about. All righty. Yeah, I didn't know if you had anything else to add. Nah, I'm good. Okay. Um... So, uh, anyway, then, uh, we see, uh, Bernie, he's, uh, watching the crazy dude for the gas station as he's walking through the woods, just talking to himself about being the runt and fucking pissed off at all the other guys. He's going to kick their ass. We start throwing parts, uh, body parts in the pond. He pulls out a head of a woman. And I think that was the crazy lady we had seen earlier. Yes, I believe uh, so too. Yeah. Uh, Mich- then we cut back to Michelle is trying to get free, but Leatherface actually stops her and he puts on Ryan's headphones onto her, but she screams at him and he screams. Then Tex comes in and they tell him they got him a new, uh, a, a present, something nice. And it's a brand new saw and it's gigantic and imprinted on it. Uh, it says the saw is family. It's and also, so- everything is chromed. Yeah, everything chromed on out. this is chromed. Even I thought that saw is pretty cool looking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you are trying to turn Leatherface into your next Cash Cal Freddy Krueger style, the first thing yeah. you do is approve upon his weapon and give him something that's iconic that a horror fan would latch onto and be like, holy fuck. And a chromed out shiny ass chainsaw that says the saw is family on it sure is a great way to grab my attention. Yeah, that will fucking do it. I mean, if they could have made this right, that's a marketable thing. Like, if it was movie was done today, you'd see replicas of that fucking thing. People be buying them for their homes and shit like that. Oh yeah, absolutely. I would be lying to you if I said that I still wasn't tempted to have that, even though I'm pretty disappointed in the movie itself these days. But the chainsaw is still pretty cool. Right. <laughs> And they did the right thing by featuring the chainsaw prominently and blurring out Leatherface as the cover. Yeah, yeah, They, they exactly, knew what they yeah. had to sell it, and this chainsaw definitely sells this fucking turkey of a movie. It really does. Yeah, totally. it's one in my mark of still works for me, this column. Like, it's the chainsaw, parts it's of this be- Leatherface, and the battles that he has, the fighting is really great because that's all Kane Hodder, and then yeah. Ken Forhey. Like, those those things right now are all still positives in the in the column there. And then also seeing Caroline Williams was was nice as well but not enough yeah. i mean out of all the out of all the horror movie guys slasher film guys you know stable weapons this has to be now the coolest one out of all of them yeah i've chromed out fucking chainsaw yeah it's uh it's up there with um the new nightmare freddy glove which some people yeah. really fucking hate but i absolutely love like it's an upgrade that i can get behind is what i'm getting at yeah i did i like that one too i thought it was a, a cool little thing they did I, I still think the coolest one, though, is the Power Glove Freddy thing. <laughs> <laughs> the video game thing. Oh, and that's around the same time that this movie is made with Friday, yeah. with uh, Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. Yep. Uh, Brecken Meyer has the coolest death in that entire franchise. He, he really does, yeah. Just goes out stoned as shit in a video game. Um, <laughs> that's how we all hope we go someday. That's, that's how we all hope we go, man. That's living the dream for all us gamers. Um, <laughs> so then... Uh, but, uh, so as he's playing with it while the, the tow truck driver guy comes in, goes, he yells at Leatherface for losing Benny, says, I can't believe you got a present for failing. I uh, takes the headphones, uh, that Leatherface shows him and throws them in the oven in the fire. Well, that pisses off Leatherface and he grabs the guy, opens up the oven and then he goes, all right, all right, I'll grab it. And he goes to use his metal hand and Leatherface makes him grab it with his real hand. 
Like, Leatherface doesn't... So, unlike the other ones, Leatherface doesn't get bullied by his family here. He's kind of the like the, the big dog in the pecking order. He forces the guys. He's like, no, you're not fucking with me like this. Shut the fuck up. This is how it happens. Well, there's some talk before they give him the saw that he's been... Junior's been unruly lately, and he's been hard to control. And I think he's sort of realized that he's doing all the hard work, and yeah. the rest of them are just fucking living off of him, or something along those lines or maybe he's just kind of sick of it and, and or maybe this is just you know uh, middle-aged you know, so leather you know, face is finally going through his teenage years mentally <laughs> too, he's, and he's also rebelling. junior which means he's probably mom's favorite so he gets to fight back like this because mom just kind of laughs and watches him do it to her uh, and yeah, even but... even shoots it and then tex even's like no 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 like as somebody else is gonna do something he's like no 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 just let him go let him figure this out <laughs> Well, and it's so. also kind of a thing where I think Tinker actually oversteps his bounds with Leatherface way too often, and this is just Leatherface reminding him. Or again, yeah. all stuff we're hinted at and we never really see. So well, we're, that's like why we're Tinker, speculating. Yeah, and it seems like Tinker tries to be like boss of the family. Yeah, he's trying to be the cook and in charge, but the fact of the matter is Drayton's fucking gone. Drayton's nowhere in sight, yeah. and there's no one here that can fill and, that gap. And Junior isn't going to take orders from Tinker if Drayton's gone. <laughs> Right, and Tex just doesn't care about anything other than causing pain and is a real sadistic yeah, prick like just, everybody yeah, else just, in the family. Yeah, he's just way more sadistic than anything else. Yeah, the, the whole family just got shortchanged into being sadistic and not psychotic just because it's easier to sell sadism, I suppose. Yeah. It gets worse well, as the, the series goes on, though. Yeah. Well, the crazy guy sees that the trap is with the trap that Benny had set off. He wonders what happened there, and just because it makes me laugh at their interaction, that's our next clip. This makes a very loud Bang. An awfully big hole. Do I know you? Shut up. Move it. Now, I am very scared of guns, mister, so please do not point that at my face. How many? I mean what, okay? How many bit sick fucks like you are there out here? Hey, baby, I only got one thing to say to you. You know what that is? I don't like the tone of your voice. What the hell's wrong with you? What is this? Booby traps, camel netting. What are you people doing out here? Big surprise. Fuck you, mister. See, even he's racist as shit because he calls him OJ. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, wow. I, if for some reason, I was like, did this in that movie, like, happen? <laughs> <laughs> like that's when it that's when it all happened it was, it was then 1990 like, oh. seems about right that yeah 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 but well, all right man i don't i don't know all that much stuff so there I you go i think he was just calling him oj because he was a black man and he's a racist fucking bastard yeah but i just their interaction when he's like do i know you <laughs> he's like listen mister I'm, I'm scared of guns okay so <laughs> <laughs> i love the way that he talks at the lake too when he's like getting yeah. all creepy and necrophile on the parts of the girl when he goes to kiss yeah. her head and everything like that uh -huh. shit's really funny i agree with you his character is fucking disgusting and yes. gross and rapey as shit but he's also the most entertaining character that we get in the film and our sort of comic relief because yeah. of how tired he is of his family's shit so like i'm conflicted on liking him for that reason you know what i mean he's yeah like i said he has some great interactions and that was just Probably the best one, though, for me, because he's like, well, uh, you, you know, he's just like, uh, do I know you? Like, a gun pointed at his face, and he's just like, do I know you? Okay, now the gun's scared. He goes, who are you? <laughs> I got one thing to say to you, mister. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, he's probably had his own family pointing guns and who knows what else at his fucking head, so he's probably not yeah. scared of anything. Um, yeah. It, this guy is supposed to be an amalgamation of the hitchhiker characters and the chop tops and everything. He's supposed to be the plucky weirdo that annoys everybody and just kind of gets shoved around here and there yeah but, exactly but like freaks out and all that but it just i don't know the actor does an excellent job and i think he's i'm gonna put him in my category of like of the upsides of this film is is the interactions he has with all the other characters and how creepy and weird he, he is it yeah. actually works in the benefit of the of the film and what, and what sucks is you never see him get to interact with his family really at all no it's like he's just saddled in later for some reason you know but yeah he's the runt i think he just he gets stuck with all the grunt work as the runt yeah, totally he says i'll show you runt i'll do this i'll do that 
<laughs> yeah, all the belly aching and all that stuff is is definitely yeah. one of the things that I liked about his character, and it kept me kind of going through the film. So yeah, I can totally see where you would put this in your positive column too. Yeah, and like I said, just just made me laugh. Anyway, that ended that twenty minutes, by the way. So we're going into our final twenty. If you have anything else to add, nah, let's just put this fucker to bed. <laughs> I've Fucking talked too much man. about it already. Just bitching and complaining. <laughs> I mean, we've made almost an hour and a half episode on this motherfucker already. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Leatherface, um, he does that little electronic game where uh, that they were talking about earlier, and I, I thought this was a, kind of a funny scene myself. I thought this was great, where it gave him a picture of a clown and says, "What is this?" And he keeps typing in food, and he goes, "Nope." Try again, and he keeps doing it. Food, food, and he keeps getting mad. He's like, of course that's food. It just tastes funny. (laughs) I knew you were going to go there. Yeah, it's (laughs) C-L-O-W-N is what it's looking for, and he's just typing (laughs) F-O-O-B. The most demented version of of the uh, character in uh, uh, fucking uh, The Stand. You know, Moon, he always spells everything M-O-O-N. That spells whatever. (laughs) Leatherface, (laughs) F-O-O-D. That spells clown. (laughs) Uh, Well, Benny's watching him doing this, and he's like... Benny is uh, what another thing I love the way Ken played this is he's just constantly like, "What the fuck is wrong with all these people?" <laughs> he's just so like disoriented and just confused and just cannot yeah, like just, he can't wrap his head around people that would behave like this in any way, shape, or form, and that's what makes it great. He can totally believe that someday the big collapse of the government's coming, so he wants to be ready for that, but he cannot believe. Th- these these things are happening right now. <laughs> right. Like this family is too much for him to be able to take and everything that they set up. And that is fucking yeah. awesome. Like, and he's constantly bewildered by them and just trying to figure out what the fuck is going on and just completely disoriented this whole time. It's awesome. Yes. Well, now we're getting close time to dinner. And the little girl says that they promised that she could kill the next one. So they have this like Big sledgehammer takes the rope. You pull the lever, and it will swing and hit the head. So she does so, and that kills Ryan, officially. He is dead. They start cleaning Ryan, and they talk, and this is actually our final clip. Look here, Mama. Colored drawers. (laughs) California. (laughs) (laughs) Honey, you go get washed up for supper now. Get this and skin dressed out. We'll have no sow belly for a while. Yeah, I guess that's right, huh? All we need now is a good mess of greens. Cares when we get the way to spell on you. Well, maybe we could uh, let Junior play son. He does make the sweetest damn babies, you know. Junior likes them private parts. We knows what to do with them parts. Got that right, Mama. <laughs> Cut my own out years back. I did. Took care of Papa's too. Be your turn soon, little gal. Hey, Tex, come have my skin this. Are they hinting that she is pro-rape but against sex for pleasure with that clip? I believe so. Uh, it, it also apparently cut off Grandpa's... I don't know if they're saying she cut off Grandpa's dick or balls or both, but they did something. <laughs> yeah, is she hinting that she knows how to make people sterile so they'll stop yeah. having kids and then they can keep having all the sex that they want? Like, there's That's so much... so possible. There's so many implications in this that, once again, is set up and then just left there. Like, they're yeah. doing this shorthand, extremely rapey, really kind of gross, sexual abusive type talk where they're like, oh, well, we don't need you for food, so now you're going to be a fuck doll for Junior. And when he says the sweetest babies, did you notice he's looking at the little sister as in that little girl happens to be Junior's daughter that they're hinting at or Leatherface's daughter? Yeah, that's kind of what I've got the feeling of is that, yeah, Leatherface makes the best babies. Do you also get the inclination that the girl that was out like in the woods that was running away may have been the mother of that daughter and no. their victim? She's only been out there for a week. Okay. But <laughs> so, so so yeah, I don't get that yet. Okay. But I get I, I get the feeling the reason she was left alive that long is that maybe she would help breed another daughter. Or another child to bring or into this family. Any child, yeah, it's any child. Right. They just uh they they allude to all of this nastiness and all of this horrible 
awful like sexual abuse and rape that this family also does which means they do not see these people as cattle like the previous incarnations of the characters did they see yeah. them as people and this is part of the joy that they get from consuming people is the torment and the pain that they can cause and they are mentally torturing them this is an expansion of just the dinner where the guys are more or less bored and they're just having her for dinner because they don't need to kill her they have more than enough food in the first movie and then also what they did in the second movie but instead of having you know the grandpa try to club her or anything like that they just go right to rapey ass deliverance shit in this part yeah i mean pretty much <laughs> that's not so, a choice yeah, they, that i it, can get behind i'm not down with that and it just makes yeah, it no it's not cool but i mean it's it's where they're going with the franchise i guess is more about the psychological torture being done on purpose instead of these people are psychologically tortured uh but the family doesn't get how it could be you know why what, why do they care right like their complete lack of understanding about you know any kind of empathy towards other human beings that's one thing where they just don't know any better and they didn't realize that having her there with them for dinner you know yeah. where she's all tied up after seeing her friends slaughtered and you know her brother's face on Leatherface like clearly the family just didn't get it in those movies especially yeah. in the second one you're the one that pointed that out they're that far gone from reality they don't even realize someone might seek revenge for them yeah they're like they thought it was a guy they thought it was competitors or someone from the health union right these people are completely well aware of the terror they're causing yeah they're self aware of it they indulge in it and they get off on it and yeah. that is not my Texas Chainsaw Massacre no. like, like the, I prefer the them Texas Chainsaw Massacre it's, uh, yeah, they, they just treat people as cattle. Yeah. I'm no different than cattle. Yeah. I would prefer them that that's how they see the people that are outside of the family is they're not human. They're just cattle and they are trying to treat them as humanely as they would animals to slaughter. Whereas this completely disregards that and goes right with the, you know, zombie torture family from. <laughs> yeah. It may, it may be like the hitchhiker was. Uh, um, uh, in the first movie was a bit into torturing, but you know, the rest of them were kind of like, you know, you guys just like the, uh, Drayton was more like, listen, there's no reason to do this. Like, let's just get it over with. Even though he you himself know? was poking her with the broom handle and yeah. listening and to make her scream. So there's a little bit of sadism in it, but yeah. it's the same thing as if someone it's, that it's, would go overly shock a cow with a cattle prod. It's still something yeah, that you would see them treat a beef that fuck way. with a pig right before if, if, you know, if they're less than a reparable, but or something whatever and fuck with a pig right before they kill it that yeah kind of thing. mess around with it's, it and like try yeah. and like torment it a little bit like that you could see them doing yeah. it but this is very but knowingly they don't register psychologically as humans to them yeah it's very knowingly psychologically torturing another human being which is not yeah. something you've seen the family do previously and I, I think the franchise is poorer for it when they make these decisions with the films like this I think so too yeah. all right let's let's stop bitching about it let's move on and get this one done because right. it's gonna get even worse from here yeah so Benny sees all this, freaks out, and just starts shooting into the house. Um, he kills mother, shoots through grandpa's stomach, pouring out all the blood that's been dumped down to his gullet. Shoots off the truck driver, the tinkers, his fingers on his hand. That is, you know, the good hand he has. Yeah, uh, he's all down this to time, three the fingers, girl, right? Yeah, had gone upstairs to wash up, of course. Michelle's able to get free, and Tex grabs her, but she grabs a knife and stabs him right in the shoulder. She's able to run out to and and finds Benny. Um, just then, the little girl flips a switch, and the, all these really big floodlights light up the front yard. Um, Leatherface is behind a truck, and he starts driving. Benny tries to shoot, but no ammo left, and it seems like the truck hits him. And then Lachelle runs into the woods, and Leatherface chases her. Uh, Benny starts getting up, and there comes... Uh, uh, Tex with a sledgehammer. He tries to hit him, but Benny's able to grab it, and they kind of have a fight. Um, Benny hits a fucking uh, gas container. <laughs> they have a great thing. Why are you doing this? And he goes, to eat. And he goes, you motherfuckers never heard of a pizza? <laughs> and he says he doesn't like it. I like liver and onions and pain, and he keeps hitting yeah. him and saying, and pain, and pain, and pain. Which, yeah. driving it home that this is a fucking zombie torture family from Cabin in the Woods done up chainsaw style. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He so, probably but, has a uh, husband's then, bulge while he's doing this. As everyone's kind of, you know, as, as Tex is a little drenched by some letter, uh, some gasoline, uh, Benny brings out his lighter, lights the whole thing up. The truck blows up. Tex is lit on fire. He burns up to a crisp. 
Um, During that and, fight sequence, um, Ken Forhey tossed Vigo Mortensen, and you actually see it in the film. Vigo gets hit on the ribs somewhere and then immediately clutches at his ribs. He actually got his ribs broken doing that fall. Ooh, damn. Yeah, you can see it if you go back and watch it if you fucking care enough to try, but I know that that yeah. happened. So there you go. Shit, yeah. Um, so then um, Michelle's running through four. She gets caught in a trap that's like a drag. It drags her. She tries to cut loose but doesn't get out, and it ends up in the body pond, or as the creepy guy called it, the soup. Um, so uh, Leatherface also gets there, but Benny shows up, and this is the cool little fight sequence where we think it's probably Kane Hodder in there. Uh, they have a great fight sequence in the pond. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, given the live chainsaw chain running around that had yeah. to be Kane Hodder, I wouldn't put it past Ken Forhey to try and do as much of his stunts as he possibly could because that seems to be Ken Forhey's style. <laughs> Yeah. But he probably had a stunt double as well. And this fight is definitely on the plus column because they're in this rotten soup of a lake that's filled with all that uh, adiposer or whatever the fucking stuff it's supposed to be. And you think they're hinting at it that basically what's going to happen is everybody who got in here is going to rot and die from this stuff because they all had various injuries that definitely the lake would have soaked in on. Yeah. But the film doesn't go there. You never deal with any of it. it you just have yeah, that in your mind that that's probably what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, it seems, though, that Leatherface is able to get a hold of the chainsaw and kill Benny. Uh, well, Michelle is able to crawl out of the pond. Leatherface grabs her, and this is where we get the callback where she, she's holding the big rock where she couldn't kill the armadillo. She repeatedly bashes in Leatherface's head until he sinks to the bottom, apparently dying. About then 11 times in the yeah. unrated version. About 11 times. She hits him in the yes, head. Yes. Um, <laughs> So, uh, let's see here. So, uh, then the next day it's morning. She kind of sits by the side of the road. Uh, there's like an oil field right next to her. Um, so, you know, people, someone's going to find her. All of a sudden the gas station truck pulls up, but who's in it? It's Benny. He's still alive. He gets her in and he goes around back while the weird dude attacks him. He was uh, the, from the gas station. He was laying in the bed of the truck. He starts attacking Michelle, but she gets all of a shotgun. He goes, you probably don't even know how to use that thing. Well, she cocks it and shoots him dead. Um, they, uh, she gets Benny back in. They drive away, but in the distance, as they drive away. We see Leatherface standing there behind them. They're, I mean, they're far enough away, but he revs up the chainsaw. Roll credits. All right, they tried to cut around it, but it's definitely clear that Benny had his head carved up and he got eviscerated in that lake with the chainsaw. That much is yeah. obvious, but because it tested so poorly to have Benny die, they brought him back at the end with no explanation as to why. Also, the female main character in this that was supposed to be like our, our main heroine that we're following, she had holes in her hands and she had been punctured in various other areas to make her bleed even more for them to feed grandpa. She she was in that same lake, so she should have gotten some kind of rot. And there was another thing where she was supposedly somehow she died, too. There's an alternate ending where she dies, where I think Leatherface comes out of the lake even after she hits him a ton of times or something or whatever. Somebody gets her and she ends up dying. And that would be more fitting with the actual Texas Chainsaw Massacre series where, you know, if she does get away, she becomes the new person that's like running around scared and screaming or whatever, you know, out onto yeah. the road and then just takes off and someone picks her up or whatever. That makes more sense when you're not even sure what's going to happen happened than what they did here. This has a false sense of hope and the Freddy's dead let's all walk off into the sunset that the other Nightmare on Elm Street style new line horror films do. Like, you know, this was their way of trying to appease the test audiences and it rings hollow and it just is kind of a huge letdown in a bunch of other things that happen in this film that are a pretty big letdown. <laughs> yeah. Now, this is I'm not ashamed to say it, the very first of all the Texas Chainsaw Massacres that I ever watched. Oh, look that the context that i saw this movie in is a never-ending series of nostalgia for me more than anything else right yeah. so i'm barely 12 years old and uh my older sister and i have the house to ourselves where um both of our parents are leaving us for about a week we're gone right Okay. We make a deal with each other. We can both have parties as long as neither one rats the other one out for mom and dad to know while while they're gone. We're totally going to do this. I get to have mine first, right? 
All right. So I invite, you know, a bunch of people over, girls, guys, all of this kind of stuff. And I'm, you know, barely even 12. What do I know about how to do a party? So I'm like, you know what? We should watch a really gross horror movie. I'm going to run a really gross horror movie. I grab Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 and I grab the unrated edition on VHS at the local video store to watch. Like, this is what I think everyone at a party should be watching and having fun with. Oh, yeah. how I have not grown past this stage in my life, Matt. <laughs> You really have not. This is these are truth facts. Okay, the night of the party when we're all hanging out, um, most of us stick around and watch the the horror movie. Everybody's kind of you know chilling and everything, watching the horror movie. Um, I'm not going to say my sister and I had any kind of substances that kids our age should not have had because I was barely even fucking twelve. Obviously, my sister would not have allowed that, even though she was you know just about a few years older than me. That wasn't gonna happen. But there's also you know. How many quotations are you using right now? Lots. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm not diamond my fucking sister out for anything, my hand. <laughs> Uh, there were, however, a bunch of preteen kids who were just starting to discover the whole boyfriend girlfriend thing. And, uh, so, you know, not everybody watched the horror movie. There was a lot of making out going on in the room while that was happening. So I'm watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre three with my girlfriend sitting next to me and she's grossed out and burying her face in my shoulder, like every five or six seconds behind us. People are making out on the couch and trying to ignore it, but something gross happens and everybody's like mood gets ruined whenever they're trying to make out or whatever's going on <laughs> and all of that kind of stuff you know and we're all just kind of like hanging out and having a good time and uh i won't tell the story as to why it's a monumental party for me specifically out of respect for the dead just put it that way <laughs> <Holy geez. laughs> my first girlfriend's gone man she died a long time ago <laughs> it's not my fault i swear um <laughs> What but the fuck, man. But immediately I don't think you have to say that. <laughs> I know. I just like to. <laughs> but uh, R.I.P. in peace. Yes. My <laughs> my fun night for Texas Chainsaw Massacre three continued after the movie was over, and so I have all of these wonderful memories of this specific movie, watching it with that specific group in that specific prepubescent sort of time frame or post pubescent at twelve for some of us, and. <laughs> <laughs> and uh I just like all of that really makes me still enjoy this movie to this day uh watching it with the film reviewer eyes completely destroyed every goodwill i had built up in this film because i really had to think about things and i was really trying to find things to talk about and i just watched it unravel so now literally all i have is some of my first awakening experiences with an early girlfriend happened directly after and or during watching texas chainsaw massacre 3 and now, i have not well, grown past that stage since matt and now when you an event happened with with said girlfriend correct uh, not an, an not not an event but um is an event with a, a capital e or an event with a smaller <laughs> a lowercase e. I don't mean to say smaller. That that doesn't sound good. A, a lowercase e. <laughs> we were making out. That's all I'm going to say, Matt, out of respect for the dead. God damn it. All right, all right, all right, all right. But I'm sure that's not all you were doing. So, okay, no, I get it. I get it. I, I think... I think I have an idea of, of where this went for you. So I'm happy for you. So it's, it's a nice little trip down memory lane. Uh, Yes. All while watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Or 3, yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is definitely, I think, left an impression on me for the rest of my life. I have not grown from that fucking 12-year-old boy sitting on a lazy boy with his girlfriend watching this movie while everybody's making out around them. And he's also making out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how mm -hmm. everybody else's mood but mine keep getting ruined by the gross stuff happening <laughs> <laughs> Yours just got better and better. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Can't yep. hear a chainsaw anymore without getting a little stiffy. Am I right? Oh, it's it's not little. It's raging. It's like yeah. Oh, I I was you know I was it was just it's a figure of speech, man. Just calm down. <laughs> <laughs> no one's saying you have a small dick. <laughs> no, 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 no. I meant that um, it wouldn't be a little stiffy. It would be like rock solid. Oh, okay, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, cha the sounds of chainsaws make me tumescent like you would not believe, my friend, is what I'm getting <laughs> like at. You just jizz your pants right away. It's all over. <laughs> Mostly from the vibrations. Well, right, because you're riding that motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I got nothing else really to say about this. I've I've vo voiced all of my disappointment in it um, in so many I like ways. I got but... legit to say about this movie. Uh, I everything I have to say, I've already said. 
So I'm done. Yeah. I can see where if you have a similar memory of what I would have, where it's a certain experience that is forever tied to uh, like an early development of your life with a film, you know, yeah, I can see where that would be something, you know what I'm saying? And actually I got, I got, I got, yeah, I I got something like that. I, (laughs) <laughs> I'm sure you do, and we'll we'll probably cover that film eventually. Some, uh, I'm sure someday. You, you will tell me off, Mike, after the show, and I promise okay. you, if you want to, so you can tell the story, we will watch that movie and cover it. I don't even care what it is, even if we do it as a bonus episode. Well, actually, it's it's too late. We've already covered it. Oh. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. All right. So I'm I'm done. I've said everything that I've had to say, and um, to my first girlfriend, even though she's no longer with us. I deeply apologize for airing our dirty laundry so publicly you on a said podcast. Nothing untoward. You said you'd have you have nothing to apologize for. You said nothing untoward. <laughs> the fact that I am implicating her in doing anything with me is enough is, is, to is besmirch toward. her good name. <laughs> I mean, you married your wife. What'd you do to her? <laughs> <laughs> to besmirch her good name? <laughs> yeah, you definitely besmirched her good name. That's that's a fact. <laughs> well, I didn't make her take my name, so at least she has her I mean, own good name yeah, still. I mean, see, yeah, that's, that's I did the same for mine. So you know, <laughs> we say this I, like we had a choice. Let's just play the promo yeah. before we get in any more trouble. Here's Geek Radio nope. Daily. We're moving on to the feedback because we actually have some. All right. Are you having trouble keeping up with the ebbs and flows of modern geekery? Is the real world holding you back from knowing what is happening in the geeky world? To answer these and other personal problems brought in by your friends, gaming group, and loved ones, Geek Radio Daily presents daily informational sessions brought to you by the wonderful Billy Flynn, the Flynnstress, and podcasting's Rich Siegfried. They contain such helpful segments as history, geek birthdays, box office results, the latest in DVD and Blu-ray, video game and comic releases. Why, they also have a Sweekly show hosted by the wonderful Billy Flynn and the Flynnstress, which includes interviews and commentary. And to make sure you are informed, Geek Radio Daily also provides you with your daily dose of geek news to make sure you know more than that jerk know-it-all Steve. Visit us at geekradiodaily.com. That's right, Geek Radio Daily. All the geek without the weight. Now available in fine Corinthian leather. Okay, so the name of the band makes me worry about them, but I do like a lot of their music, so maybe I need to examine what Past Court used to listen to. It's a band called Sacred Reich, although I couldn't find anything online about them, you know, being pro-fascist or anything like that, but that name... When you you hear the word Reich. Yeah, especially nowadays, but in the 90s... It doesn't lead to anything good. Yeah, but in the 90s, you were kind of like, yeah, that that name's a little off, but, you know... Yeah, that's that's a little... little, uh, Makes you wonder what the fuck's going on in there. (laughs) garage (laughs) yeah more or less but uh we don't have time to talk about that because we've really bitched way too much about this movie and i've told too many uncomfortable stories about my quote-unquote sexual conquest but it is time for incoming mail all right so fellow podcaster from the podcast on haunted hill dan bone reached out to me through messenger and so i'm gonna read the messages uh as i receive them so he's six hours ahead of us because he's over in the uk right matt all right these come in at 2 a.m i just so happen to maybe have been awake at that time because sometimes that happens for me sometimes you and i tend to be awake at two in the morning (laughs) i only really need about four or five hours of sleep but anyway um so this is how it came in i'm gonna read it as if he sent it as an email even though we kind of discussed it so this is this is how it's gonna go okay I must say, I am fucking loving you guys working your way through the chainsaw flicks. Bravo! That's how he wrote it. It has an exclamation point. Also, I am sorry I missed your 
in quotes, shout out for the 300th episode thing with a dash. Been busy prepping for the baby's arrival. Dude's about to have two twins, like about to have twins. So yeah. And then two twins. Well, that makes it sound like you have four kids. (laughs) His wife's not Octomom. God damn it. He's going to (laughs) have, he's having twins. All right. All right. He's got to, he's going to have a set. So it's babies plural. All right. And he's having a tag team. That's nice. Yes. It's nice for him. All right. So prepping for the baby's arrival, comma, but X, like all capital letters. So that's why I shouted it. Yeah. Congrats to you too. He used the number two there. Ah. Absolute top lads. And in parentheses, he writes, as we say over here, another dash. Keep ah, do- we're <laughs> top lads. <laughs> Keep doing what you do because what you do makes me goo. I think he did that so I would have a clip. Oh, nice. What you do. There you go. I'm not adding to that clip. So, <laughs> uh, and then he says, and you can quote me on that. So, uh, Dan, oh. Dan bone says that what cinema psyops do makes him goo. All right. Well, goo for him. <laughs> and then, uh, after that he wrote, sorry, I've had too much coffee. Uh, anyway, well done. Bye for now. No such thing. Yeah. No such thing as too much coffee. You keep drinking it, man. Yeah, absolutely. Indulge yourself. So I'm guessing that uh, Dan was just reaching out just to reach out to me. And then I actually did talk to him. And I'm like, hey, uh, this is everything you pretty much wanted to say, right? That's written here. I'll just read that on the air and we'll, we'll thank you for yeah. the congrats. How's that? And he's like, yeah, that sounds mm-hmm. perfect. I mean, dude, you're having twins. Yeah. We get yeah, it. You don't have the time to reach out to us. That's fine. And you, go ahead, man. Your 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 wife or significant other. I I, I don't know if he's married wife, or not. Wife, they're married. Uh, wife yeah. is your wife is birthing the next great tag team. So your energy should be focused on making sure she is completely comfortable. Yes, and congratulations on living up to your surname and making said babies. Yes, congratulations. Dan has accused me of working in swear words as other artists work in clay or oils. <laughs> It's something that he's actually gone on about. Like now I know I'm quoting the Christmas story, but the way that he described me once on the show about my ability to use the word fuck and like, you know, as like a transitional phrase and like how impressed he is with that and my, my ability to swear, like he made it sound like there's something respectable and commendable about my foul mouth. And I felt so good about myself after he said that. (laughs) <laughs> I've always said you and I, uh, fuck could be a comma for both of us. Yeah, it's uh, it's a when we really get going. It's a transitional phrase. Yeah, especially yeah. especially when we're arguing with each other, uh, we bicker yeah. like an old married couple. That happens for sure. <laughs> we really fucking do. That's that's not. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, you're not lying they've they've heard it where this is like 302 episodes yeah. they've heard it yeah, they i know. mean they know yeah. they know <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you so much for reaching out to us dan even though you are super busy and uh writing up that little message just to let us know that you're enjoying the show and the feedback uh that's exactly what i crave especially from a peer like yourself that i happen to respect so thank you very much dan yeah, thanks, Dan. That's really nice of you. And I respond right away, unlike Matt, who has gone 18 weeks. Isn't that right, Darren? Yeah, yeah, it's 18 weeks. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I want to break the streak now. It's like the Goldberg win streak of WCW Nitro. When do you end it? Now. Now? All right. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which Versus the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.
<laughs> All right, so if it's spelled L A with an umlaut over it, A with an umlaut over it, Z. I've never heard of the band before this, but apparently they exist. It's Laz Rocket. Laz Rocket. Is, is that what two A's with a? Why am I asking you? You don't know how to fucking uh, pronounce. I don't shit. fucking know what the fuck. Yeah, Jesus. Laz Rocket. I guess I don't know, but they did the song Leatherface specifically for uh, this movie, and uh, huh? I can't stop laughing when I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, those guys may have worked really hard on that song. I know, but it's so fucking funny. Minutes were spent writing that song. Oh, no, definitely more than that. I mean, there was a uh, lot of work put into this four minutes and 20 seconds song, and I'm not going to disparage them for that. But my God, it makes me laugh every time I fucking hear it. I hope they were trying to have a little bit of fun with it. And I'm sure. Yeah, I'm hoping there's a little tongue-in-cheek humor in this when they played it, because I don't want to disparage them unless I absolutely have to, but whatever. It's all right. <laughs> disparage them. It's a fuck. If you'd like to find other instances where we've hinted at past sexual experiences we've had during the watching of said films that we cover, and or anytime I disparage a band just because I think their name is a little funny and so is the song that they wrote for Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, any previous 301 instances that may or may not have happened that is available at legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops we also have our meme repository or at least the place that i store the memes that i share to our people cinema underscore psyops on the gram of insta we're also available as a facebook group cinema psyops and then i am there as court psyops and matt is sometimes there as matt psyop although he's been tagged in several photos that will not be revealed until he responds back to darren and yet he still hasn't even noticed any of that yeah i know i'm busy i'm a busy man lately <laughs> you can email feedback to matt who will not respond for 18 to 19 weeks matt sign up matt at gmail.com uh if you want a quicker response or at least someone who gives somewhat of a fuck about what the listeners think and or feel email feedback to court cinema psyops court at gmail.com i care what they feel and think i'm just too paralyzed with fear to discuss it with them <laughs> That I believe more than you're busy. I believe that you are more terrified to put yourself out there than what people realize. That is what I think it might be. I mean, you know, if you want to fucking, yeah, talk fucking sense, fine, whatever, I don't give a shit. <laughs> if you'd like to twit a couple of tweets to a couple of twats on the shameless porn bot filled fest that is known as Twitter of people that have no shame and I thank them for it. I am at court underscore psy up there following many of you, if you know what I mean, and I think you do. And he is yeah, also stalking. at psy up Matt. Cyber. Just cyber stalking Matt. Just cyber. That's barely anything at all now. Yeah, it's just only slightly more creepy that that's, way. That's what the kids call foreplay. Well, while the kids are out there experiencing Experiencing that foreplay to Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, kick the fuck out of that week and make it your bitch. Hear me okay? Yep, here you good. And I am recording. One, two, three. Look at you all business all the time. Fucking A. <laughs> yeah, I want to get this over with too. <laughs> I, I, I sense <laughs> I know, that's right? the direction that we're going. So this is this is, uh, this is just uh, this is some bad stuff happening here. <laughs> Don't spoil it for everybody just yet. Um, oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Right, 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 right. Okay, so I thought you just cut this and put this at the end, like hold my other horse. Yeah. Uh, usually, yes.
We do have one piece of feedback that's going to be me reading it. Uh, there was a fellow podcaster who is extremely busy and wasn't able to get to us for the 300 episode and just kind of contacted me through Messenger to lament that. And so I was like, well, I'll just read this. Is that fine? And they're like, yes, do that. <laughs> that sounds perfect. And they're like, yes, that sounds excellent. <laughs> yes. Thank you for your assistance. Yeah, so that's uh, that's what I'm doing. And I'm actually kind of cropping that image right now so that I can just kind of have it there and ready to read. So You're putting on a crop top. I got you. Awesome. Yeah, I look awful in one. So that's perfect for me. Oh, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, my man. So, <laughs> Yeah, but I don't know anyone who actually would think that I'm beautiful in a crop top. <laughs> You if, know they're, what? if they're out there, then more power to them, I suppose. Yeah, I was going to say, there's someone out there, trust me. There's <laughs> someone out there who thinks I look beautiful in a crop top. <laughs> now you're just fooling with yourself. <laughs> no, that comes after the show. I'll start fooling with myself, but it's fine. <laughs> All right. I don't know if I really need to differentiate between the Patreon version versus the regular version when you and I are recording, because to me, the yeah. only real version is going to be the one that I get to do the way I want. And then everything else is, you know, just pretty much that gets released to the main feed because that's what I can get away with on the main feed. So that's how I'm looking at it. Because um, I realized last episode, all we did was talk about the music I was playing when we come in from it. <laughs> and nobody can hear that if they're on the main feed. That's going to be so annoying. <laughs> oh, man, that's just going to be weird. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not doing two different takes of the intros for that. So we're just going to yeah. do the show as we do the show, and then the main feed will suffer if it suffers, you know? Well, we just do what we do. Yeah. All right. So let's do what we do and get it rolling. You good to go? Drinking yeah. everything? Fucking A. Yeah. Got it all. All right. Let's go. Now, obviously, this shit is going to be edited down to where this music is going to be playing over top of us talking about Death Angel before I said the trailer. I gotcha. And then the actual trailer kicks in. But if, you ever, if you've never seen the actual trailer, it's fucking hilarious. Is it? And, um, oh no, she hasn't shown up yet, but there's something else that you were saying that I wanted to kind of point out, but you haven't quite, I don't think you've necessarily gotten there just yet. So then we come to a gas station and we see Aragon. He gets out of a car. So I'm like, is this Lord of the Rings? What are we doing? Um, uh, it's Tex, Matt. His name is Tex. And if you try to yeah, call no, him it, anything it's, it's, other it's than Aragon. Tex. So it's Aragon. If so. you try to call him anything other than Tex in this movie, he go and chop you with a freaking cleaver. So, something tells me he going to chop me with a cleaver no matter what. Have you seen me? I am perfect for pit barbecue. I'm oh, just yeah. telling you. Yeah, there's <laughs> there's no fat cap down on you no matter which way you turn no, you. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just saying, I'm nothing but fucking flavor, yo. So... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'm nothing but fucking flavor, yo. But fucking flavor, yo. But fucking flavor. Um, it fucking always fucked me up here. Okay. <laughs> Ken Forhey is the main redeeming quality of this film for me. And then also seeing Viggo Mortensen, a.k.a. Aragon, a.k.a. Yeah. the second best, if not the best cinematic devil of all time. You could argue Tim Curry was better. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say. But he's you technically might, goes by... Arguments. He technically goes by darkness, whereas he is named as the devil or Satan in the prophecy. Yeah. So most of us would remember Sherilyn Fenn from just one of the guys and really just... Only think about Cheryl and Friend from that point forward when they remembered she was in it. Yeah. Well, well there you go. I'm going to be busy for like three minutes. Can you just, you know, do the notes now? Yeah. Uh, uh, hey, man. Just. I'll mute the mic. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah I'll mute the mic. It's fine. Jesus Christ, you fucking weirdo. Anyway, wait till after the show, like me. I'm, I'm almost done! I'm, I'm, a, I'm a professional. I'm anyway. just washing my hands! <laughs> yeah, that's a lie. And then that leads to our next clip. Yeah. Oh, that's weird. I can't hear your clip, like, at all. I, I couldn't hear that either. Oh, now it's working. Fuck that.
the kids are out there experiencing that foreplay to Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, kick the fuck out of that week and make it your bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so what movie was it? We'll just put it at the end here now that we're out. All right. All right. Well, I was a late bloomer. Um, and by that, I mean, um, I was kind of an idiot. Uh, I know. Hard, hard to believe. Um, and I never really picked up on girl signals. Now looking back, there were many times in high school where more things could have happened with girls, but I never got the signal that they liked me like that. You straight up had to, like, slap me in the face to tell me this. Uh, so, really, I didn't have my coming out of my shell toes in college. And uh, it was uh, it was Animal House. Ah, I thought it was going to be Animal House. So you're, yeah. you're having Animal House as a group watch in college, and that's when uh, you ended up hooking up? Yeah, it was a yeah, it was a uh, everyone was in my dorm, but we you know lights were turned off. It was just a group of people, and uh, and yeah, I was just I was on my bed, and uh, we did me and my roommate still did classic bunk style beds, and I had the lower bunk, and uh, me and the, this girl who I kind of just been talking to were in there, and just yeah. <laughs> During Animal House, you got the throwdown. I mean, not the full throwdown. It, it, it was the, the lowercase t throw down. I mean, it was, it was, <laughs> but it was, it was, but it was the first action <laughs> that part of me had ever seen. <laughs> it was very grateful for that it. was not done by me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that may or may not have been what I was hitting at as well. Yeah, yeah, that, I mean, that's what I was with the group of people there. You have to be hit, but it was, it was awkward as fuck, but. I mean, I was also a 19-year-old getting ready to explode. So, yeah, it it still happened. (laughs) So, kind of the same experience, but it still frames out both of our lives for both of those movies. That's that's really interesting. Are you still recording? Because I'm using all of this shit. I I am definitely still recording, so I figured I better... (laughs) Yeah, you better stop now before you say anything worse. Yeah, yeah, it stopped. Now (laughs) now before I say anything worse, I don't remember her name. (laughs) I caught that on my side. I'm still using that. <laughs> I thought, fucking, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm stopping on my side now. We're done.